Welcome learners. We are going to discuss the bronzes of Indian sculptures. Indian sculptures are a long history. In fact, we don't know much about the very, very ancient time. The first time we come to know about bronze sculpture, that is a dancing girl, was discovered in Indus Valley civilization in Harappa. That is the earliest find of a sculpture in bronze. Undoubtedly, the sculpture that we called Dancing Girl is one of the most perfect example of craftsmanship as well as artistic quality. The dancing figure is a small one. Nonetheless, its quality is so high, it won't be wrong to assume that for a long, long time, this use of metal or bronze were very much in, in India. What is bronze? Bronze is a kind of alloy, which is the combination of tin and copper. Copper is a soft and tin is not so nice to look at. So the artist combined both tin and copper to get a new kind of alloy which is called bronze. And with this many many artifacts, statuettes and statues are made in ancient India and it continued for long long time. After Indus Valley civilization, we know there is a very long gap which is almost empty, vacant to us. We don't know what happened during this time. But from the Mauryan period later on, we will find a lot of sculptures are made in bronze and other metals. Let us first know how the bronze or metal sculptures are done. There are mainly two methods in which these sculptures are made. One is called lost wax process. In Sanskrit we call it a madhu In this technique what happened we make a sculpture in beeswax and later we transfer it into a model in bronze. Let us discuss how it is done. Let us know about the lost wax method. In this process, first you make a model in clay. This is made of clay. You have done a model like this. After that, you put a layer of wax all over it. Leave this area, the bottom. This is wax. Now, this hole is covered with wax. You give all the detail on it, whatever you want to do. So, your modeling is done, all over. Put a layer of molding material all over it, covering the whole model of clay and wax. Don't forget to leave some hole in this area. And sometimes some hole also in those two sides. Next stage. 
what we are going to do. Now you put it upside down. That means this part comes here and this part comes here. You have two holes here. Now the molten bronze that is a mix of tin and copper will be poured through these holes. What happens? This is the layer of the wax. The molten heat of the metal replace the wax here. That means it is totally turned into gas and comes out of that and it is replaced with the whole thing with metal. After some time when it is cooled down, you just break this mold and you get the sculpture here. This is the metal part of the sculpture. So ultimately the wax part is replaced with the metal and then you break the mold and you get the sculpture. Other method is known as sand casting which we'll discuss later. Interestingly, for thousands of years, Indian sculptors are using Modhuchrishya or Lost Wax process. Most beautiful works since the time of Mauryan and onwards were done in this process. There are distinctly two types of methods that is used with some changes here and there. That is in the north India and later in the south India. Most scholars believe that lost wax process actually started in north India and later it moved to south. If we study the history of art of India, we will find that there are so many sculptures that are made of metal during the age of the Mauryan, later Sungas, Satavahanas and in the Gupta period also. The Bakataka dynasty also one of the great patrons of metal sculptures. Sculptures of India, mainly that of deity or god and goddesses. Hindu religion is very much popular with three gods that is Shiva, Vishnu and Brahma, the destroyer, creator and protector. And so many such sculptures in bronze were made of these three deities or gods. Before we come to understand the beauty of sculpture in metal, let us know some canons, some rules that are followed by sculptors when they are making such sculptures. In the Shilpa texts like Vishnu Dhanvatara Purana, Shilpa Ratnam, they have prescribed very clearly how to make the images of gods and goddesses. The sculptors had to follow all these rules when they prepare an image of gods and goddesses, which we say that they follow the iconography of gods and goddesses. Let's know something about the typical way of making sculptures of gods and goddesses. In the making of metal sculpture or bronze sculptures, ancient Indian sculptors followed 
the rule of Shilpa text or Shilpa Shastra. There are some prescribed postures that we have to follow. The first one I'll show you. This is called Sama Vada Bhanga. Sama Vada Bhanga. That means the weight of the body is equally on two feet. Most of the sculptures or image of Surya you will find in this particular posture and this is very much restricted to the sculpture they follow it exactly. Next one. This is called Abhanga. Abhanga postures. In this posture, one leg or foot take the pressure of the body and other leg or foot is just touching slightly on the ground. So you have a little curve here in the waistline and then it is almost straight where it's actually touching the ground. Many sculptures we will find later, especially of Parvati and uh, other saints that was actually made by the South Indian bronze sculptors are generally in Avhanga pose. The third and most popular form of posture is called Trivhanga pose. We all know about it, especially when we watch an image of Krishna with his flukes. They are mostly in this Trivhanga posture. Trivhanga means three bend of the human body. So you see, first bend, second bend, and then the third bend. So it, it is called Trivanga. This is the Trivanga posture, which is specially uh, used in the case of bronze or better sculpture of Krishna. Now the fourth one.
This is called a atibhanga. Atibhanga postures. Especially the sculpture of Nataraja is made in this particular posture. All these large size sculptures in the round specially are made with Madhuchrishta or lost wax process. But there is another process that I have already mentioned, sand casting. Generally small, small pieces of sculptures like uh, a flat or one-sided elevation can be made with this sand casting process. Let us know how to do it. We have two boxes. Now, you pour some sand mixed with wax in this. Then make a model of clay. This is the model of clay. Now, you put this here and press it in inside. It's clear? You pressing this model of clay in the sand and after that you take out the clay model. What have what is happening? You create an empty area of the same form of clay here. It's like a press here. Then in another box you pour sand and oil wax mixture. Then you bring this here. Ah, in the meantime, you keep two holes here and here. That will lead to this area. Okay? Now you put it on this. This is the box you are putting on this. So you have two boxes. And the hole is there. Remember, this part is empty one. The same model that created this vacuum here. Now, this pipe leads to this vacant position. Okay, I think it's clear now how it is done. Now, molten metal you pour through this hole and this molten metal will cover the whole area that is created the empty by this model. After it cools down you take out the top box and extract 
the whole thing out and we will get the same model not in clay but in metal. This is called sand casting. Let us see how all these prescriptions of Shilpa Shastras had been used by the sculptors in bronze sculpturing. This is a good example of Shamapada Bhaga. You notice that weight of the two legs on the two feet and on the pedestal. It is almost rigid and just straight in appearance. As I told you, most of the sculptures or images of Surya should have been done in this particular posture. Here is one of the most beautiful sculptures from South India, Chola Bronze, in which you see how beautifully the Mukuta and the postures on the arms and hands that Shankha, Padma, Gada, Chakra, that the four attributes of God are used in this a particular sculpture. This is again a sculpture of Parvati from the Chola period. You must have noticed the change in the posture. Instead of Samabhanga, now the posture is Abhanga. Almost all the female figures, particularly Parvati and others, are in this posture. Here you see one leg is straight that means it is taking the whole weight of the body and our other leg is slightly touching on the ground. So it gives a small turn of the waist and the torso of the figure. So this del delicate and very beautifully mobile posture is known as Abhanga pose. Now the most popular form of posture is Trivanga pose, which is particularly attributed to the image of Krishna. Here you can see the figure. It has three bent. One, two, three. This is one of the classical posture in Indian sculpture. This is a Chola bronze and you can see how beautifully the sculptor has managed to bring the softness of the movement. There is no hardness, no hard curve anywhere you will see in this particular sculpture. Smoothly the movement of this Trivanga pose has been attributed to this particular sculpture. Here is another Trivanga posture. In this case it is not Krishna but his consort Sri Radha. This bronze is from Bengal and you can see the typical characteristics of Bakura terracotta sculptures is reflected in this particular sculpture. It is clearly you are seeking that three movement of the body here. So it is also known as the Trimhanga posture. Now we come to the last posture that has been defined by the Shilpa text, Otibhanga posture. There are not many sculptures we find in this particular posture except that of Nataraja, who is performing his Tandav Nritta, the ultimate cosmic dance. Nataraja is not only a sculpture, it is only a philosophy that has been totally materialized in the terms of sculpture. Every form, every limb, every posture is symbolic. Here he is standing on a small figure of a dwarf, Apasmara. 
the symbol of ignorance seen and the god is trampling on this particular door so nataraj is one of the best bronze sculpture of a metal sculpture not only of india but over the whole world learners hope you have understood the essence of this lecture you know how to make sculpture in metal and what are the posture and expression of indian sculptures thank you